Welcome to the Global Waterworks special webinar, How COVID-19 Made the Case for the Digital Transformation in Water. I'm Mary Conley Eggert, Founder and Chief Innovation Officer at Global Waterworks, and our focus is on connecting those in need of solutions with the technologists, and the organizations, and the experts who can solve our global water challenges. And uh, in front of you are a team of experts who, who would agree with the idea you'd never want to waste a crisis. Uh, they have not done that. They've taken advantage of the opportunity to work remotely and manage and innovate to even identify uh, COVID-19 in wastewater. You'll hear more about that in a moment. I just want to thank our sponsor, Go Agua, who contributed content as well as uh, their support and expertise uh, to make this webinar possible. They've been innovating for the last 13 years as a utility and have packaged up uh, their knowledge and uh, capabilities in software that you can deploy at any size utility. And you'll hear about that shortly. So uh, the reality is, is this is not a single stop. We won't end today's webinar with uh, you all have Having accomplished uh, the digital transformation, but uh, we want to, you to know that at the end of today's webinar, you'll hear more about the resources you see in front of you right now. Um, an ebook that captures uh, the process for remote managing and uh, addressing challenges in the context of a crisis, as well as uh, SWAN and the Water Tower and Global Waterworks Connect, all organizations that offer additional access to experts and collaboration opportunities that we hope to see you at. So um, the truth is uh, we are here because uh, the challenges have uh, been mounting. That's uh, more than what we saw at the start of 2020 when we knew we already had crumbling infrastructure and uh, uh, challenges meeting demand and meeting quality uh, requirements. Uh, today you have additional financial challenges, the unexpected costs of maintaining operations during um, this uh, time where you're trying to safeguard staff from a virus. Uh, revenue shortfalls as uh, demand has shifted to residences and uh, the businesses that had the larger demand are are not uh, sometimes not able to pay their bills. And you also have health and safety challenges, rotating shifts and uh, people on sick leave and uh, of special uh, personal private protective gear. And um, we know the operational challenges have uh, really mounted with people expecting more information more quickly and, um, and the need for more stakeholders to be involved in decisions while you're all remote. If that's not enough. Um, the financial impact that AMWA and NACWA have tallied suggests approximately 34 billion in additional expenses or um, costs that uh, that agencies need to make up in order to maintain operations. So there's definitely a need to do more things more efficiently. And I'm thrilled to have a team of experts who will address how you can do that through their examples. And so uh, join me in welcoming our uh, exceptional team. Jaime Barba is uh, the global CEO for GoAgua, and he's also the chief digital officer. Actually, he calls himself disruption officer, uh, leading Global Omnium's digital transformation. A great resource coming to us from Spain. Um, Gary Wong, who's the principal of the global water industry for OSIsoft, is also uh, SWAN North America's chair, actually SWAN America's chair, and a wonderful collaborator on most anything related to uh, data and the digital transformation of our utilities. Um, Hardeep Anand is deputy director for Miami-Dade Sewer and Water, and he was the sponsor of, uh, or his team sponsored SWAN's last annual conference there in Miami. A great uh, um, evidence or example of resilience. And finally, Melissa Meeker has uh, headed up uh, Florida's uh, water management efforts, as well as the Water Reuse Association movement, and uh, now is uh, um, launching a new water tower. I mentioned the Digital Demonstration Center, and she is the chief ex ex executive officer of that. And I say Digital Demonstration Center, but it will also be a physical demonstration hub. And you'll hear more from her in a few moments. Um, we wanted to get a feel for where you're at in the water sector. So uh, the response to the poll suggested that those on this call are uh, in the right place. You're from the technology areas, but uh, we also want others outside of technology to learn about the opportunities and uh, have a smattering of um, regulation folks and uh, 
uh, utility operators are present, and also um, there's a group of other, based on registrations, looks like academic and research organizations, as well as some nonprofits and uh, business entities outside of water, which is wonderful. Um, from your utilities, vantage point where you're at on the spectrum of digital transformation we asked you that and learned that a full 33 percent are just getting started so you are in the right place uh, to learn about the process that uh, ensures success many of you have started on the journey and could probably contribute knowledge in the q a period and finally about 21 percent of you are pretty far along optimizing or automating uh, your operations uh, the 33% and all who are involved naturally have to deal with the data in order to provide insight and to automate. You need to collect data, and uh, we have an enormity of data. Uh, the question is, what data do we need? Where do we need it? And how do we structure it for processing? We're fortunate to have Gary Wong, who's chairman, I mentioned, of Swan Americas, to talk about uh, the data infrastructure and how do you structure that. Great. And that, that data core is really having the ability to uh, provide ease of access to that data with technologies and software straight out of the box, we're, we're able to integrate multiple systems in all these different data silos, passing data back and forth, being able to manage the data, and making sense of that, providing context to all that raw data. And oftentimes we hear the situation oh, we have too much data. Well, we really think that's, that's not true. It just means that you're probably not managing that data the way you need it to. Uh, so, you know, having that data core, why don't we just take a look at a couple of examples and we'll start off with the city of Riverside in California. They provide water, wastewater services and uh, power to about 300,000 people. Uh, what you see in front of you is a live water operations dashboard. Now, before they implemented their data core, they had a dashboard as well. However, it took them four hours a day to create the dashboard, and the dashboard was a snapshot in time 24 hours ago. So they're really, you know, at the time, they weren't getting any situational awareness. And uh, everything that they saw was kind of happening, you know, a day in the past. So with what you see in front of you now, everything is completely real time. And as you can imagine right now, it's so important to have the ability to be able to remotely monitor and to see exactly what's happening out in your operations. Um, you know, now with this, they're, they're saving four hours a day and they're having real time data. And not only that, they're looking at uh, their energy consumption, uh, the water delivery, the water quality, and in the end, they're saving $820,000 a year. So that, that's huge. So it's, it's not only times of, of crises, but of course, you know, during day-to-day -day operations, that digital transformation allows you to reap those benefits. If we take a look at uh, the next slide here, we're looking at Hampton Roads Sanitation District in Virginia. Uh, they're a wastewater utility. Uh, organization and uh, for about 1.7 million people. And what they've embraced is truly, you know, using the data core to provide that one pane of glass. You know, that that's kind of what we hear about, meaning if I'm able to log into my system, in this case, they, they open up a web browser or, you know, any kind of uh, mobile device, and they're seeing information from multiple systems. Uh, you know, they see a lot of hurricanes every year, and one thing they, they do is they take all this data, at, which you see in front of you, uh, including weather data, radar, satellite uh, forecasting, and so forth, to forecast, you know, what type of damage uh, those hurricanes could do to them and what do they need to do to mitigate those risks. So you're seeing information from about, you know, eight to ten different sources here, and uh, last year, what was really interesting was um, two days before Hurricane Dorian was going to hit them, uh, they got a notification um, basically on their mobile device, on their phone, saying that one of their data centers was starting to heat up. Uh, they got another notification within 15 minutes saying it hit about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that point, they're able to see exactly what was happening 
They dispatch crews, and within 90 minutes, they're able to rectify and resolve the entire situation, all remotely. And you know, having that ability to see exactly what's happening is uh, really critical, especially during the times that we're facing now. So with that, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Jaime Barba, uh, the CEO of Global Omnium, and he's gonna provide you some more insight and a couple of case studies. Thank you so much, uh, Gary. Uh, we we are uh, we, we come from from Spain, from from Valencia. Um, uh, we are we are a, a utility that match all, um, all over uh, 400 municipalities in Spain, uh, four million of customers there. Um, Twelve years ago, uh, we decided to make a, a digital transformation uh, that uh, was focused in, in two in two branches. Uh, the first, uh, the infrastructures, the sensorizing and managing the infrastructures, and the second, the processes of the people. Uh, one of the most important projects that we that we uh, deployed was uh, the smart metering fixed network of one million of smart meters. It was the first AME in, in Europe. Uh, please next. And, um, where, what we learned when we did this this project. Uh, is that uh, we, we need for the management, for the global management of a, of a water company, we need a solution, a remote uh, solution that, that should uh, help us to, to, to make four, four, uh, four challenges. The first is to be transparent. The second uh, is to be efficient. The third is to be um, resilient. And the fourth is to be holistic, in a holistic solution. To be transparent, for example, we need uh, the work order management. We need to tell the citizens where we are cleaning the sewage network. We need to tell and to explain the, the citizens where we are uh, taking the samples and, and for, for them to see what is, which is the, the quality of water. To be efficient, uh, we, we should uh, apply all our technology to, to find leaks. Uh, of course, minimum night flow, but uh, we need to, for example, modeling to find the leaks, or for example, if we have a smart metering, we need uh, to use hydraulic balances to be able to understand which is the water that is coming inside the network and which is the water that the, the households are consuming in, in a moment. And cross this information, for example, with the billing system. To be efficient, too, uh, in the plants and in the networks, uh, we need uh, to have systems that are non-dependent from SCADAs. Systems that take the information and allows that any skill of the organization of an organization can access to the information of the facilities of the sensors of these facilities, the pumps, the, the tanks, not just uh, in the hands of the people that manage the SCADA. Uh, when we have this, when we have digitized the infrastructures, we are able to deploy efficiency to, for example, in the blowers of a sewage plant to be efficient with the energy. Or, for example, in the in the drinking water plant, to be efficient with the chemical products, or to have plants difference when we have campaigns of agriculture in a sewage plant, or we have rainy different rainy situations, or we can deploy in the in the network a digital twin that help us to know what's going to happen in the next 15 minutes with the forecast demand. If we are running this digital twin in real time. And we can uh, show uh, different scenarios in the future of, of, the, of, of what's going to happen if we change different infrastructures. Later, we'll talk about this. Uh, so we, we are, uh, please, next, we are, we are transparent, we are efficient, and we need to be resilient. Uh, we need to be ready to, for any kind of natural disaster. We, if we have the whole uh, remote solution, we are able to, to understand what's going to happen when we have natural disasters as this pandemic that, that no one of us is expecting. For example, we have the patterns of consumption and we are alerting the government who is fulfilling the confinement or not because we know who is in the households. Or for example, we are uh, explaining uh, who, who is, uh, if, if some of the industries or shops that should be, that, that, that are closed, have any kind of, of leak, and we are alerting them about, about the leak. Or for example, we have the all dependent people in their houses, and we know that if they don't have consumption in all the day, we are going to alert their families. 
or for example, if we have the patterns of consumption uh, another time, we are able to explain the, the municipality, which, is, which should be the distribution into the hospital because they know where the people is living. If we have digital channels, good digital channels in a, in a customer-centric uh, orientation, we are able to increase the use of the formalities uh, by, the, by the digital channels. For example, in Europe, we have noticed that, more, uh, that we have increased 34% of these channels to, 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 for the formalities. And for example, if we have workers, in, uh, we can have them in their houses and we can uh, distribute their, their works with a work, uh, with, with a work force uh, system because they can receive all the work orders inside the, inside the cellulars. So uh, we are resilient, but we should be too, uh, please next, we, we should be too, uh, so, um, uh, so uh, holistic. If we have, as a theory has explained, different silos of information, uh, we cannot access in a real time to the different information. We need to cross all the data in, in, uh, pro properly uh, to, to be able to, to deploy good solution, a good resilient solution. So for example, uh, this is an example of a digital twin. Uh, we can receive the patterns of consumption of the, of the smart metering information. With these patterns of consumption, we know, for example, that at eight o'clock everyone is clapping, so we are going to have a change of consumption. We know that uh, the the consumers in the early morning have changed their 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 way of behavior, and they are consuming after lunch. And this change is is changing the operation management, uh, the changing the management of the pressures, the management of the pumps, and the management of the of the valves. So with the digital the digital twin we can understand what's going to happen in this scenario in the future and, uh, and we can uh, deploy these scenarios for the, for, for in, in, in some hours and we can get the, uh, a, a good trainment for the, for the operators because we have simulators uh, of, the, of the network for, for, for being able to train the, the people that manage the, 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 the network. Finally, we can, if we have any kind of, of emergency, uh, we are able to understand what's going to happen in the future. We can know if we break a pipe, what's going to happen, with what we are going to, to do in the future. So later, maybe, later in the question and answers, uh, we can uh, answer all the questions that you have about this kind of technologies. Now I, uh, I, I leave you with Hardeep. And that is going to from Miami Day that is going to to explain us uh, about resiliency uh, plan. Thank you, Jaime, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy to be here to share some of our experiences uh, from Miami Dade. Um, I would not be able to get into a lot of the specifics because of time constraints. But I think the purpose of today's conversation is to uh, piggyback on what Gary and Jaime said and connected to what Melissa is going to share with us uh, after me is some of the challenges we had pre-pandemic and, and you know how are we going to be aligning ourselves with, with some, of the, some of the challenges that the pandemic has posed. So in the context of that conversation, obviously data becomes a big conversation as uh, spoken by the two previous speakers. And uh, you know, from remote operations to gaining insights into uh, the work we do from an operational standpoint all becomes very relevant. Uh, as Miami-Dade, we are a coastal community and uh, we've got three water plants, three wastewater plants, 2.3 million residents, uh, a bunch of production wells. Uh, we obviously are ground zero from a standpoint of climate change and uh, from a standpoint of sea level rise. And uh, what's also unique is we've got a, a system of more than a thousand pump stations uh, in the county uh, with over 6,000 miles in the collection system. Our capital program is pretty large. It's about 7.5 billion over the next uh, about 10 to 12 years. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, you know, piggybacking to the previous slide, I think, you know, as I said, we are a coastal community. We've got water from all sides. We've got uh, a very shallow water table, uh, rising seas. Uh, we are a seagrass to a sawgrass ecosystem with the Everglades on one side, the ocean on the other side, a very porous uh, uh, limestone geology 
and therefore anything to do with infrastructure whether it is uh, hardening our assets or whether it is designing our aging infrastructure from a standpoint of uh, renewal and replacement uh, we have to keep this in, in the context it's obviously one of the most critical shock and stresses uh, that we always consider when we when we talk about our assets or even from an operational standpoint next one now this slide i just put up here just for for kind of a little bit uh, a thought provoking slide you know the, the slide above uh, that blue bar that you see uh, the area above the blue bar are all the shocks and stresses we we talk about in the context of resiliency and everything below that uh, the list is not exhaustive by any uh, stretch of imagination is adapting to a remote workforce culture loss of revenue from non-residential water use we've seen uh, you know not residential water use consumption go up maybe non-residential commercial go down uh, we're still analyzing to see what the net impacts are from a from a fiscal standpoint and from a revenue standpoint financial resilience becomes an important conversation and then the cost of programs for customers who have difficulty in paying their bills still due to the COVID-19 issues. These are newer scenarios that are emerging on our horizon. And we already had the scenarios uh, above the blue bar uh, that were existing. So in, the, in this journey of uh, the digital journey, uh, we are all in different places, uh, depending on where we are within the utilities ecosystem. And, and therefore, you know, it becomes important from a resilience standpoint to be able to continuously look for these shocks and stresses and be able to adapt to them uh, as they come forward. And that's the definition that was put forward by uh, the 100 zillion cities, which we were very fortunate to be a part of. The next slide, please. So obviously today's topic is about data. We all have a lot of data. And this is something that I had picked up from a previous presentation where I believe quintillion is 18 zeros. 2.5 quintillion bytes of data is created every day. 90% uh, of the data in the world was generated over the past two years. And the number of smart devices is projected uh, to reach 200 billion uh, by the year 2020. That's, that's a big number. So when we talk about that, um, and I think Gary and I, we both have talked about how uh, you get data coming in from different disparate sources, and it could be a big clutter. Uh, the cloud and the Internet of Things uh, do have a lot to offer on one hand. And on the other hand, it obviously becomes important that this data becomes streamlined. It has um, uh, intelligence, of course, built through the, the quality of the data, because otherwise it's uh, garbage in, garbage out. And then the amount of delay, since the amount of data that we're collecting is at staggering rates, uh, much of it is being created and pulled in the cloud or at IoT endpoints. Uh, the good news is that cloud analytics has rapidly increased the ease, the accessibility, and the capability uh, of performing these complex data analysis on very large data sets. And this is the concept of where the digital twin comes in, which is nothing but a, vit a visual, a virtual representation of a physical object or a system across its entire life cycle using, of course, real time data. And the digital twin replicas can be used how to, uh, to model how the physical asset will perform under certain conditions, but will also help monitor asset performance in real time. And so that is the aspiration, I think, that we where a utility like ours would, would like to, to go to eventually. The question is, how, what are all the, the building blocks to get there? And I think, in, in humbly in my opinion, there are several lanes that come from different places. As far as lanes, I mean, uh, by lanes, I mean data sources. And then they all converge at some point. And I came across this information, which talked about the five Vs, which talks about the velocity, the rate at which data is coming, the amount of data, the, the quality and the variety of data, the truthfulness of the data, you know, the methodology that we collect uh, the data with, is it repeatable? Because if the data is not, uh, the veracity of the data is questionable, then obviously the decision making, whether it's a digital twin or whether it's any other uh, dashboard becomes very questionable. And then ultimately, you know, not all data is important. What's the value that that data pro provides? Are we capturing the right quality, the right kind of data to begin with? And then the slide, the, 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 the picture on the right side talks about data wisdom. And, you know, at some point we were talking about being very descriptive and uh, then it became diagnostic in terms of, you know, why is, why is certain things happening based on the data that we're collecting? And we all talk about uh, being predictive, right? And uh, a stitch in time saves nine of a concept where if you're able to collect data and you're able to 
to predict something in the future, then you're able to take adaptive and mitigative action so that a certain condition doesn't happen. And it all boils down to optimizing our operations and performance uh, so that ultimately it saves money if you're able to replace or renew or, or uh, rehab an asset, then it of course saves money to the utilities in the long term. These are some of the attributes that I picked up from the utility of the future. And as I said, when we started, we are all in different uh, in a different path on this journey. And regardless of where we are, I think all of these attributes have to come together uh, to be a true utility for future. So I'll be happy to share more uh, context in depth uh, in person with anyone who might be interested. But at this point, due to time constraints, I'll end it here. And I'll pass it on to Melissa Meeker. She's the CEO of the Water Tower. And I think Melissa is going to share with us some of the work on research innovation uh, happening at the Water Tower. Thank you, Hardeep. Um, and great information by the previous three speakers. Um, I'm gonna try and put a little finer point on how COVID-19 made the case for digital technologies. Uh, I think all three of our speakers talked about how um, you know, the, the pandemic has really put a focus on workforce challenges and that's the personal aspect. Um, as we look at in the future and now still protecting our essential employees for the long haul, it's really the ability to harness data, which we all have, uh, that's gonna enable us to do that. Now, just to say the obvious here, not all utilities, like the examples that we've heard about uh, in this call, have the ability or the resources, either technical or financial, um, or even among their silos to be as innovative um, as, as they could be. Um, you know, a lot of utilities, especially the small and mediums, are really focused on the challenge of today, the force main that just broke, uh, you know, this list of things that they've got to accomplish now. And that ability to really focus on the future, I think, is our industry's biggest challenge. So in that point, next slide, please, it's very important that we um, have platforms like Global Water Works and the One Water Academy. Uh, which are virtual platforms that can help us collaborate and learn from each other. But my vision in the water tower is really to create a physical space, a physical space where we can focus on four key principles, applied research, next slide, technology innovation, workforce development, and community engagement. So when you, when I talk about those four tiers, or uh, platforms, if you will, it's really the integration of those that is so critical. So what we are focused on is creating a, a physical space, an ecosystem where examples like the ones we've heard about today, get shared with the people who, who need it most. So vendors are challenged in their marketing ability and their sales team and the amount of people that they can reach, the people in the utilities they can reach, but creating a physical space where we actually have a core workforce development and training piece that exposes people to technologies, I think will do our industry the greatest benefit. So we are focused on partnering with our state certification organizations who do all the water, wastewater, and stormwater certifications to do the trainings on our campus. We have a field aspect associated with that as well as classroom space. We'll have space for virtual meetings, conferences, workshops, uh, specific trainings on digital technologies. But a really cool component will be our master control room, which will be this large control room that visualizes and provides exposure to those boots on the ground to new technologies. So it's the ability to, without sales pressure, experience those technologies and see case studies like the ones we've heard about today that actually have a dramatic effect on a utility's ability to be efficient and effective, to see those, to see which ones would work in their utilities, to break down that fear of data and show them how they can harness it. And that's really what, what we're focused on. Thank you, Melissa, and, uh, and Jaime, and Gary, and Hardeep. Uh, excellent overview of what's happening with digital utilities. And I just want to remind everyone that these resources are available to navigate beyond today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all at Melissa's Water Tower for the grand opening. And when is that, Melissa? 
uh, this time next year. Knock on Yeah, board. perfect. And uh, all online at Swan's Conference, July 22nd to the 24th. You can download the ebook by uh, Goagua and also join in the conversation at uh, Global Waterworks Connect. But we do have questions if you want to uh, attend to your interest for today's session. So please note your questions in uh, in the question box or in the chat window, and we'll get to those. And I know that um, we had a few come in beforehand, and I'd like to go to Jaime first. Uh, why do you think utilities need to do this now more than ever? Yes, uh, I think that, that digital transformation for the utilities is, is I believe, is, is something that is, is mandatory. Uh, not, not well, Everyone uh, has been explaining this uh, the last the last four years, five years, it has been fashionable. Uh, as I told, we started uh, 12 years ago to do it. And uh, what we learned is that when you have it, you are able to be resilient, as we have explained uh, before. For example, uh, now we are uh, explaining the, the, the municipality that, that uh, the, we have reduced the, the breaks of the pipes because uh, it has been reduced, the, the worth of maintenance or in in telcos and in, in other in, in electric, electricity and in other kind of utilities. Um, and we have the information almost in, in real time. Or, or for example, because we were ready to, to do that, we are now, uh, we have signed with governance of Spain uh, a, a contract uh, to analyze the, the, the sewage network uh, in, in, the, in the area where we, where we work. Uh, we, we have we have we are analyzing the the the, the, the virus the, the genetical unit of, of the virus and we are presenting this information in, in, in a panel analyzing historics uh, since, since we started for a for a, a early early alert for, for having an early alert system we deploy the work orders of the people that is taking the samples in the in in one digital scenario, they have an app to understand which are the which are the results of the sample, and this is all connected to the to the SCADA and to the GIS system. And if you don't have all the tools to do that, you are not able to deploy uh, solutions in, in them quickly quickly. And so now is the moment because because now everyone has understand understood that they need to operate the network from their homes. So they have understood that they need to, to automatize almost all the operation management. For us, all the, all, the, all the procedures that we have deployed those days in the months uh, before, the, before the, we, have, we have started with the COVID uh, has, has been uh, helped by, by good tools and uh, by good, good solutions that has helped to deploy this kind of, of uh, in quickly this kind of, of or solutions for the for the for the people and for the workers. So I think that that now is the moment to to do this. Right. In order to respond to a situation, you need to know what's going on. And you guys have uh, both implemented uh, remote monitoring and automation, but also the remote detection of COVID-19, uh, which is incredible for Spain. And we look forward to seeing how that's deployed here in. Uh, United States with your colleague uh, Pablo Calabuig, who uh, is also um, here on the call, but I am um, thrilled to have you here with us. And Gary, I had a question come in of uh, you regarding uh, the roadmap for digitized utilities, um, uh, delivering customer support in order to ensure seamless data collection, but also seamless answers to the questions about what's happening today in our wastewater and water. Yeah, absolutely. So, for example, at OSI Soft, we have a number of uh, white papers and case studies that talk about the entire uh, digital transformation journey. And as you've already seen, it's it's a continuous journey, and you know people are in different parts of that. But you have to start somewhere. And I can think of a number of examples uh, from our industry. You know, regardless of their size, the, even the small to mid-sized organizations, uh, Comox Valley Water District is, is one example I can think of. They're about, you know, 100,000 people in terms of the population they serve. And once they got on board and 
started to do the remote uh, operations and monitoring and uh, predictive analytics and all these kinds of things, the way they did business actually changed. So instead of, for example, driving to work into the control center and then finding out what they need to do, they could just do that all from home, right? And you can imagine that uh, the situation would be completely different for them uh, during, especially during this pandemic, if they didn't get on board uh, and didn't start that journey. So, you know, I really encourage people to, to start somewhere. Uh, also, SWAN uh, has, a, has a great, um, you know, has like five levels in terms of, you know, that uh, digital transformation and that journey as well. So there's, there's a lot of information and we can definitely provide more of that uh, after our call. Yeah, um, that's perfect. And I think uh, it brings to mind Melissa's role in driving forward uh, reuse and these initiatives that ha have been harder for regulators to adapt or have required bringing more people in. And we have a question here, what's the best way to convince elected officials or water boards to fund digital improvements for water? That's a, a great question. Um, you know, just going back to that reuse example, or even the um, you know the role that I hope to play at the water tower, it's that showing the return on investment and what that is. And not all the technologies out there are going to actually save significant resources, but they are going to help you be more efficient and more effective. Um, you know, so I, I think it's a it's a balance of bringing all that together. Right, and I think uh, the demonstrations will go a long way in doing that. Hopefully, you'll have lots of boards coming down with their operators to see Absolutely. what would be possible. Yeah, and uh, as utilities undergo digital transformation, what type of training should operators be focusing on? And I'll throw that out to Hardeep, who's uh, head of the One Water Academy. Thank you, Mary. Um, you know, a lot of thoughts come in mind and piggybacking on the previous question, besides what Melissa talked about, I think education obviously becomes critical and the academy's role is more about taking bite-sized conversations of complex issues, right? I mean, if you take digital twin, it can be a very complex topic, but how do you granulate it in a manner that it, it's obviously easily understandable by the young professionals, by the operators, by elected officials, by the modelers? Um, and, and, and then all of them come together to the table to put this digital twin concept together in terms of operating uh, you know, in some sort of unison. So the Academy's goal there is to reach out to the knowledge holders, you know, uh, both from technology providers, solution providers, uh, academia and consultants and bring it all together. That's one prong. Specifically on the operators, I think the opportunities are abundant, uh, Mary. Uh, if, if the pandemic has exposed so many, uh, obviously, issues, learning and development and training uh, will become something which becomes of paramount importance. And one thought that comes to mind is the use of virtual reality um, and, and augmented reality um, for training purposes. And we are exploring this to see, you know, how can we take what is happening in the field, whether it's flushing a hydrant or operating a piece of equipment, and if we can further professionalize that environment by incorporating technologies and infusing the learning environment with these skill sets, then the, the learning environment becomes repeatable, scalable, but it also becomes very enriching uh, to the learner uh, as well as uh, to the entire ecosystem of practitioners within the within the water community. Yeah, I, it's a go I'm ahead, sorry. Melissa. Yeah, if I can just follow up on that, Hardeep, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the exciting things that that we're looking at. Yeah, let me take a step back. I went through my 40-hour wastewater course, worst 40 hours of my life. I think I slept <laughs> three quarters. I mean, just so dry and so hard. So, you know, even I consider myself relatively smart to sit through that class and try and understand those things when you could do it in a virtual reality way and actually show how the process and the water flows through the plant and what those treatment technologies do. Such a huge benefit, especially in 
you know, the generations that we're training now that are, you know, they're looking for gamification. So some great opportunities there to really break down some, some barriers that uh, we've been seeing in some of our seasoned uh, employees. Yeah, as, as an, uh, uh, if, I, if I can uh, answer Hadib uh, sometimes, some, uh, as, as, as an example, for example, we, we have uh, in one of our uh, cities, in, in the main city in Valencia, we have a, a system where that is managed by, by, by pressure. Uh, it's, they are, it's bugs and, and the system is, is connected to, to a digital twin and what is happening to us is that the people, the people that is in the in the in the control room, uh, is people that is making future scenarios, making simulations to understand what's going to happen if they uh, get uh, changes in the in the regulator bugs. So uh, finally, when they have a, a, a as Melissa tell and as Hadif has explained, a digital twin, they have the chance fail because they are virtually failing and they have the chance to train uh, because they are uh, continuous training so with, when th one thing as what we are living that change all the patterns of consumption change uh, suddenly they have the tools to to solve the situation so i think that yeah, uh, that what, what is not difficult in, in in this kind of companies always is, is to train the people uh, is, is, uh, and, and to and to understand the to 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 how to understand the people that this is this is mandatory because the, the, there is uh, sometimes there is the uh, the people is against this kind of changes sometimes because they have uh, know how we, we tell that there is some people that is golden people so, sorry for the for the expression but these people that have the ring they have know how and they they don't want to 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 give the know how to the organization so these kind of tools breaks these dynamics. How that all the people uh, join together to to solve uh, the the problems and the situations that that comes with with some as as COVID or some some uh, different uh, disasters. Right, and and I mean when you can capture the knowledge as you guys are doing of the operators so that it can be deployed to everyone, then we can actually scale the utilities and allocate people where they can continue to add value rather than replicating knowledge that's been created, create it once and, and share through your tools. And uh, uh, on that, I'm hoping that Gary can respond to uh, this question. Can you provide additional information on how artificial intelligence is contributing to this digital transformation? Maybe building on what Jaime shared. Sure, uh, so artificial intelligence neural networks, machine learning, they have been around for many, many years. And, uh, you know, the challenge has always been finding the right parameters and having reliable data that can feed these uh, types of, you know, software packages. Uh, they're, they play a real critical role. You know, they take a, a lot of different pieces of data and uh, they have to be in a certain format, so the data has to be cleansed uh, and shaped into certain formats that, you know, these uh, artificial intelligent type systems can understand. Uh, and then that gets fed and they, you know, run through their algorithm, algorithms and scenarios and they provide predictions. Uh, of course, once those predictions are out, then you can also compare, you know, actuals versus, you know, forecasted and, you know, figure out if uh, those predictions made sense or not. So it is an iterative uh, type process, but the main thing is with uh, all these ty types of uh, AI and machine learning type uh, systems, they absolutely need that that data. So you know when we I talked about you know that ease of access to data, that that not only means for people as ourselves, but also for these types of applications, because uh, any of these AI uh, or digital twin or any types of models without data, they're pretty much completely useless because uh, you need to feed them the, the necessary data for those systems to, you know, kind of start making sense of it. Yes, and uh, we had a question from um, Bill Teichmiller, who represents many smaller utilities, and they might not have all of the resources to access the same analytics that the large utilities do. Jaime, can you speak to uh, access? for small utilities for your types of systems? What could be available? 
Yeah, because uh, what, when you when what you have is a, is is a, uh, you have digitized all what is happening in an infrastructure. You don't mind the size of the infrastructure if you have uh, a really a data centric solution that has break broken the the silos. If you have broken the silos, if you have if you have silos of information and you break the silos and you have good functionality, holistic functionality on top of this of these data centric management system you don't mind the size of of the scalability and the size of the of the company where, where we are you are working with for example we are giving the service to uh, to uh, cities that have 5000 uh, inhabitants and with the same technology we are giving the service to cities that have uh, 1 million or 1.5 million inhabitants and uh, is the same technology is the same deploy but these different, of course, numbers of, uh, of amount of of, um, of data. And the, the reason is that uh, what you do is a good data model, a good cleaning data system, and because a, the AI, the artificial intelligence, without a good cleaning data is nothing. Uh, a, a good criteria, a hydraulic criteria for this data cleaning. Because you you don't you cannot make a data cleaning just with math mathematicians. You need uh, uh, data science that know uh, things about the uh, the statistics, statistics technology, but uh, but uh, also things about water. Uh, and when you have cleaned the data and when you have uh, the the data centric uh, to have a, a holistic view with all the information of or for example uh, the the eis the scalars the cmms wherever but not crossing the data in an spaghetti we would tell an spaghetti topology everyone against everyone uh, uh, having the data in a data centric um, solution with different with different holistic view on top uh, that that get the results of, of the leaks of the network management of the of the infrastructures of the building and, and that the, the system can cross all this information so when you have this uh, you don't mind the scalability if you are ready for big scalabilities you don't need uh, uh, to to do you can give the service to to small small towns yeah that that's a beautiful offer. I, I heard you say if they have five thousand connections or around that, there's a turnkey solution. I know a smart SCADA implementation, a rapid ramp up for utilities who are in need, who want to uh, start managing remotely. So thank you for that. And I heard a, a really cool question that was directed to Melissa, but I think all of you would probably enjoy answering it, is what are the technologies in water that are most exciting to you right now? If you could share what it is and why just a quick we'll start with melissa oh that's an impossible one to answer oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> your favorite. Yeah. i uh you know I'm, I'm most excited about uh the digital twin concept and for me that's it's really the training and predictive abilities that you have from that and it could be a digital twin of a pump station all the way to a digital twin of the entire system so you know, you hear digital twin and everyone has a different definition of what that is. But to me, it's what what we can do with that tool, even starting off small and building to, you know, the entire system or beyond. I mean, I'm, I'm actually talking to some people about a regional one for Lake Lanier and and, and um, drinking water facilities. So there's all kinds of opportunities there. It's very exciting. Wow, and who doesn't want to go to a, a hub like yours and be able to fail through a digital twin versus in the exactly. real world that they don't have <laughs> exactly. to later? And I know uh, GoAgua is going to make their system available to you, so that's very exciting. So um, great, and uh, yeah. and Pradeep, your technology? Yeah, I think you know, as as Melissa said, there's so many, but the the ones that surface to the top for me are leak detection, non-revenue water related uh, technologies asset management clearly from a standpoint of having a robust system that is able to um, kind of predict the quality the life of your assets and and when do you have to take intervening measures and, and water quality is something that is surfacing lately uh, to the top at least in this part 
uh, of the world with specifics to Biscayne Bay. We are seeing issues with respect to stormwater runoff, remembering the whole one water concept. So when we talk about sensors and we talk about real time monitoring of water quality, uh, and then, of course, all of these things come together in the concept of a dig digital twin eventually. So I would say water quality, non-revenue water, and asset management. Yeah, well, that's three, so you get extra credit. Thanks, Hardeep. Gary. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's lots happening in the industry, but what excites me the most uh, is all the uh, industrial Internet of Things and sensors. Uh, we need more sensors out in our distribution system, our collection systems, all these remote locations. Without the sensors, they're kind of really dark to us, they're unknown. We can't really see exactly what's happening. So there's a lot of these uh, sensors that are out there now uh, looking at water quality, our sewer system, our collection system, for example, and smart meters. And I think this is going to really change how we do business. Right, and the prices are coming down tremendously too. So absolutely, it's a absolutely. Beautiful new, yeah, and Jaime, we know you're the king of the digital twin out there, but uh, favorite technology and you have, you have left me less less uh, things to to select. <laughs> so I, I agree with with Hardeep, for example, uh, about assets, leaks, and, and quality of data using multi-parametric zones. I, I agree totally with, with that. That is the present and the digital twin, of course. Uh, and maybe if there is left one one thing to to ex to explain is the smart metering. We need we need these patterns of consumption to know to know the 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 behavior of the consumers, and this is going to help us to 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 calibrate the the digital twin. This is going to help us to to give uh, added services in a customer centric view. This is going to help us to to help uh, the government administration in situations like like uh, the one that we are living in in, in COVID. So smart metering uh, would be the one that I I, I choose. And talking about the future, a uh, uh, long future, maybe maybe the 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 next the next step will be the 5G. We are we are making some pilots with smart metering with 5G. Uh, with uh, uh, trying to to send uh, other kind of informations, but talking about today, uh, asset management, leaks, infrastructures, quality of of water, and smart metering, and everything, of course, uh, on top, uh, digital twin. Yeah, it sounds like you're all in heated agreement. Let's fix the leaks. Let's get sensors out there so we can get informed and uh, and make our uh, operators smart and efficient and uh, save money so that we can justify more of these digital implementations. And I know uh, Melissa and Hardeep said they're about 50% of the way through that progression for uh, digital twins. As uh, you go off of today's program, you're going to get a survey. We'd like to hear what your next step is and your likelihood to take that step, but also um, remember, we're going to have additional resources. We'll send out this set, set of slides and we just have a few more questions. If you want to stay on, uh, just to address those. If you have another question, just chime in. But um, here's one on data on how COVID-19 will affect the long-term CAPEX of utilities. Who would like to answer that? Um, Hardeep, because of the resilience and asset monitoring? Well I'll take a crack at it. It is still premature, so take it with a grain of salt as we learn every day. Um, and I'll start with some of the analytics that's happening in the in the space of you know measuring the the DNA of the virus in the wastewater streams. And from that comes you know infrastructure and capex costs, but also opex, right? I mean biohazard. Uh, um, preventive uh, maintenance, I mean, the PPE for staff and all that stuff comes on the OPEX side. The CAPEX side could, could involve some treatment uh, change in the unit ops uh, as far as wastewater treatment is concerned, all dependent and a function of what it does to the virus in the wastewater stream over time. And, and I think there's a lot of effort happening. Uh, the Water Research Foundation is doing some work. The EPA is, is putting some information together. Um, I know we are working with a, with a firm called uh, Biobot uh, out of MIT. Uh, Pablo from um, Luago and I discussed about some of the technologies that I believe 
the government of Spain has worked with Valencia, so I'm interested in, in, in exploring that more. A lot of information is being amassed at the moment, but I think from a, besides changes to the operational trains at treatment plants, and of course the consumption of water has gone up also. So that's something to be seen and how we would have to uh, you know, respond to maybe increase in capacities down the road. Uh, all of that becomes uh, a function of CapEx and OpEx. Yeah, and a related question on that, I'll, I'll give to Gary and uh, Jaime, is that the impact of geography as demand shifts and you're monitoring that, is that changing um, scarcity issues, like where you didn't have plans to deliver water in certain places or increasing risk around compliance? We know with these buildings people are going into that might be empty. I like your thoughts on that. I know you're monitoring for demand. So Jaime, maybe you start. Uh, the question is related uh, to to uh, to the lack of water. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? I, I haven't heard. Uh, right, it's really the impact of the shifting demand, you know, for water, which I know you all were monitoring quickly, changing your operation to supply, you know, consumers with water when they were at home rather than buildings. So, how has the shift in demand uh, either potentially expose you to scarcity issues, if at all, or to compliance issues? Yeah, yeah. As I, in, in, my last, in my last slide, I have presented, for example, the, the change of the, of the patterns of consumption. This is, this is true data of, of Spain. What has happened, for example, is that, uh, as, as you are explaining, uh, everyone has, has changed their, their, their uh, behavior uh, at, at eight o'clock, we can see that everyone is in the balconies clapping the sanitaries, uh, and when and, and there is it's, it's similar to a a, food, a, a, a big uh, the best sport event. The, the, and, and for example, we, we can see that in the early morning, uh, the the people is not consuming all the water before going out. They are confined in confinement, so they they consume the water after after the the land. And you can see that the industry has has stopped of consumption. We have uh, reduced between seven and fifteen percent of, of of water, uh, and all these, of course, uh, have a great impact in the operation and management. Uh, uh, what we see is that you need to maintain the pressure, the constant pressure, and the service, and and the and the and the consumers are changing their their, their behavior. So you need to be fast uh, to, to change your operation management. And for this, uh, what we have done is to, to analyze with the digital twin how if we change the different valves, the different uh, uh, pumps in different times, uh, how, how is the impact in the, in the network? After seeing that, we have uh, get decisions and has, uh, in, in, in few hours, we are operating the new, the new situation. So the technology is helping us to, to, to understand what's going to happen and which is the, the solution. Yeah, that's beautiful. Additional eyes for you. And Gary, anything to add to that? Uh, yes, just very quickly. It comes back down to operations optimization. So we need to have the sensors out there. We need to have the automation there in place so we can see what the demand is now. And we can figure out where to provide the water, when, where, which sources do we have to blend the water, maintain the water quality? So again, it comes down to having that, that data available, providing the context around it and start making sense of it all. Yes, and uh, I just wanna thank our excellent panel for talking about how you can make sense of it, starting with gathering the data, providing the analytics for use cases and informing your utilities, making sure they are resilient and know their needs. And then as Melissa was doing, demonstrating that all happening. Uh, this uh, program was brought to you in part by SWAN and uh, there are a number of reasons to join SWAN. We mentioned uh, all of us are members and uh, there's tremendous networking, research, uh, Gary's chairman, uh, uh, agreeable fun guy to have drinks with after the swan gatherings. Hopefully those will happen again soon. And uh, uh, just a 
uh, great alliances, connections across Americas and leadership uh, opportunities to uh, grow your organization and uh, uh, our nation and uh, world. Um, anything you want to add to that, Gary, or maybe you could just comment on the annual conference coming up? Yeah, so we're, we're going digital, of course, and SWAN is that one-stop shop for all things uh, digital in, in our water industry. So uh, yes, July 22nd to the 24th, uh, is our annual conference. Uh, you know, it moves around. This year it's going to be digital, so everyone will be able to access from uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and then finally, in November, we also have, you know, a conference with the AWWA on the uh, Smart Water uh, Symposium. And uh, that's going to be in Austin, November 10 to 11. Uh, we'll see what, you know, what the situation is at that time, whether it's going to be in person or, or digital. Uh, but that's going to be a great event on all smart things uh, related to water. Yes, thank you. And I, I just want to uh, mm -hmm. thank you all and uh, thank Go Agua for sponsoring this. Um, they are um, both a contributor of uh, support and a tremendous knowledge applications, as you heard from Jaime and uh, um, Pablo Calabuig, who heads up the North American effort, uh, is uh, also providing resources regularly online. You can follow him on social channels, but he is a, a tremendous um, connector and uh, leader of the initiatives that Jaime mentioned 